So, we've got a small pancake of a rover on the lunar surface now, and after driving around for ages, I decided to pay a visit to the first and so far only flag we've planted on another celestial body so far. Given that our goal is to plant a flag on every single one we can, the first flag is something of a monument now. So what better way to show respect for it than to see if we can knock it over with this guy for science. On and on we drive, watching the distance tick down until finally we crest the final hill, and the Borealis One Lander is right there in sight, an absolute success that would be nothing but the most exciting quick stop on this rover's journey until all four wheels simultaneously bust at the goal line. I don't know, something about being too stressed out or something. Well, no matter. We've still made it here regardless, to our very first flag, so frustratingly close to being able to ram into it and see what happens. But alas, it was for naught. The mission must come to an end, as without working wheels, Lunera 1 has become nothing more than space debris, akin to the spent descent stage of Borealis 1 and its flag which defies me still by standing there, upright, unrammed, menacingly. Okay, you know what? No. Let's go fix the rover. Yep, we are sending an entire moon rocket just to fix a small rover. Well, not exactly. We do also have a lunar landing contract, which specifies a quote-unquote targeted landing spot, which happens to be an entire biome on the surface. So I figure if we can pinpoint a landing exactly where the rover is, that should very well count as a targeted landing as well, and will force complete the contract. You know, it gets the point across, and it one-ups it if you ask me. Well, we did it. We landed exactly where we needed to without any problems. And after our engineer is mercilessly thrown from the ladder by something supernatural, he gets to work fixing up the wheels of our small rover. Though we do happen to acquire one small additional problem that prevents it from moving around on its own accord, it is now flipped upside down somehow. Yeah, moon must be haunted or something. Best not to think about it. Instead, we'll drag the rover as close to our lander as we can and see if both our Kerbals can bash their helmets into it or something. It's pretty much the only idea I've got apart from hacking gravity, but where's the fun in that? It's not like I'm fighting the Kraken here or anything.
some Kerbal miracle, we flipped the darn thing over. I'm just as surprised that it worked as the Kerbals are, but we've got a working rover now, and I didn't just spend an entire lunar landing mission just to be responsible with it and try not to hit a flag. But I understand that there may be forces here protecting that first one, so no matter, we'll plant another one and see what happens. Aside from almost flipping the rover once more, we've determined these flags are sturdy as ever, and by now I'd say we've pretty much had our fun as well. But we happen to have encountered a unique opportunity as well. No Kerbal has before stayed on the lunar surface during the night, and the sun happens to be on the horizon. overhead changing its inclination in preparation for lunar ascent, the crew of Borealis 5 observe just how eerie the darkness is here on the moon. It's all-encompassing. Without any atmosphere to reflect particles of light, it is truly an abyss of nothing. At least we think there's nothing out here but rocks, right? Like, the moon isn't actually haunted, right? That celestial night, two Kerbals arose from the lunar surface, as the crew of Borealis 5 were on their way home. Though I fear that is only the best case scenario we're able to consider, as undoubtedly it is not the only one. Reading reports of the Nebula Aurora Borealis 5 mission, reviewing audio logs, rewatching footage taken from the Lunera 1 rover, something isn't right with it all. While the crew of Borealis 5 were on the surface, they were adamant something was affecting things around them. Flight surgeons in the control room were certain space hallucinations were to blame, we've witnessed this before, but vital signs didn't seem to indicate any abnormalities that we would expect to see. Nothing outside of conditions you would expect to see from two spooked carbonauts, that is, like blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, it seems not out of the ordinary. But this happened on several occasions during their stay on the surface. What it is, they can't really explain. Not that they don't know how, they are our best and brightest. If anyone could dissect and analyze any anomaly, it's them. No, it's like they've lost all memory of it. There are bits and pieces missing, and that's what concerns me. Flight surgeons spend a lot of time with them in quarantine when they got back, concluding acute exposure to solar radiation may be the cause for this, and they seem to be dismissive about the whole thing. 
telling them and telling us that it should not have any long-term consequences whatsoever. And I'm not sure if I believe that or not. Uh, regardless, the paperwork is complete, and they're free to go home and enjoy a much-deserved vacation. But there is just one thing that's bothering me about this, above all else. As the crew embarked from the lander to explore the surface and observe the unique experience of Lunar Night's total blackness, there was about five minutes of mostly static on the EVA audio recording devices, and the crew don't have any recollection of this either. The thing is, that static, it never went away from that point on. I mean, it was extraordinarily present in the suits, everyone could hear it, uh, which dismissed it due to the low bandwidth and the way the suits were designed, but the static seemed to follow them back into the lander, and that's what nobody else seemed to notice. It, it followed it back into Aurora and all the way home. I even heard it in the recovery communication state, I swear. Uh, now, static and noise in the communications loop is not abnormal, it's... it's very, very present. Comms are noisy as hell communicating with Aurora and Borealis all the way from Earth, and we account for this a lot, but this static isn't random, it's not fluctuating, it is an exact frequency that is not on par with the other noise we would usually hear. And you can see it, you can see it in the graphs. I've been alone in the break room staring at the wave patterns that were printed out on these long sheets of paper hoping it's nothing but a noisy system in the spacecraft, but like I said, something just isn't right, it's not. The static appears in the EVA suits and then moves to the lander at the exact timestamp. The crew re-enters Borealis for the final time. It isn't present in the Aurora spacecraft at all until Borealis arrives in orbit to dock with it. At the exact timestamp, the docking array is opened, and the two spacecraft become one. The static was there ever since, all the way through Earth entry and recovery. I listened to the recordings so closely for so long. I've been I've been here all nights, and I swear that I'm starting to hear it. I swear that I can still hear it, unless. Well, what if What if I do hear it? Is it coming through the intercom? And what if, if something was there on the moon? What if we brought it back with us?